Chapter 6 The Awakening Meanwhile in the spirit realms, Robert is sat on a long white couch, with Jacob sat opposite, in a white wing-back chair. It appears the floor is made of fluffy white clouds. OK, kid, let's dig into some of your family stuff, shall we? Jacob says. What do you want to know? Well, tell me about your old man. My father is Leo R. Bernstein II. He's a senior partner and hugely acclaimed corporate lawyer. He does billion-dollar global mergers and acquisition deals. He's one of the smartest lawyers I know. He's feared and respected in equal measure. He's never not won a deal. Nails it every time. He gives his all to his work. I do sometimes wish he'd had more time for me, but he's always provided for us all and he gave me the best education anyone could wish for. I was sent away to Marlborough College and then Harvard Law School. I did the New York Bar and then came back and did my British solicitor exams. I pushed myself as hard as I could because I've been trying to live up to my father ever since. Being in the shadow of Leo Bernstein is never easy, but I've not done too badly so far. I have a great position in Mishkon Derea, and I'm probably one of the best divorce lawyers in the country. Or I was. So what did you learn about life from him? To get on, you have to smash it. You've got to kill it. Be smarter than the next guy, take no prisoners. It's all about perception. In my game, you're only as good as your last job. You have to dominate the room, you have to impress, and you have to know how and when to go for the kill. I have an instinct for weakness. I grew up with it. I can smell it, and that's why I always win. Hmm, what about your mother? She came from a very old British family. Old money with minor royal connections. Originally from Wiltshire. She did fine art and history at St Andrews, but never really had to work. I think she did do a stint in a gallery in New York, and that's where she met my dad. He was really up and coming at the time, and he swept her off her feet. Unfortunately, she was a bit too weak. He was a force to be reckoned with, and she never stood up to him. He walked all over her. I think he got bored in the end. They didn't really have anything in common, and she was never enough for him. I never really got on that well with her either, for the same reason. Nothing in common. And if she had been stronger and raised her game, he wouldn't have left us. I never saw him, thanks to her. So what did you learn from her? That women are intrinsically weak and unreliable. They like strong men even when they say they don't, but they're usually not interesting enough to keep our attention. Whatever the Me Too movement blabs on about, trust me, they're always looking for the alpha male. And men will always be looking for the next conquest or the next challenge. That's the way it is. Mm, OK, interesting views you have there. And your sister? Sarah? Don't get me started on her. She's a total loser. Right fruit loop. She's actually really bright and good looking. She went to great schools, had all sorts of opportunities. And what does she do? She works as a primary school teacher with special needs kids. He uses his fingers to demonstrate the quote-unquote marks. For all the money spent on her education, what a waste. She's also a right card-carrying Me Too eco-warrior, vegan, new age, crystal-wearing hippie. Spends her free time chanting and meditating and all that crap. She's always trying to convert me and drag me to her weird little shindigs. Properly away with the fairies. She drives me mad. Don't get me wrong, I do love her. I just don't get her at all. The only saving grace is that at least she's now working in a private school. Before that, she was in a scummy state school. For God's sake, it's just embarrassing. She has no real ambition, no savings, lives in a crap area, is probably going to end up with a complete and utter loser who votes Labour, and God help us all if she decides to reproduce. Such a waste. Dad doesn't get her either. I blame Mum, actually. She shouldn't have encouraged her. And Dad tried to stop it, but no one listened. No wonder he left. I really don't blame him. Have you ever wondered why you chose these two as your parents? Are you crazy? I didn't choose them. I think you'll find you did. What are you talking about? That's nuts. OK, Mr Wise Guy, I think you need a little bit of an education. Jacob imitates Robert's gesture. Then he stands up, puffs out his chest and glowers right into his face. I'm going to show you exactly how things are run around here. 
For starters, the reason why you don't remember any of this is that when you're born, your mind gets wiped. Everything kaput. Gone. So I'm going to let you off this time. But don't waste my time. I've got other souls who are more advanced and a damn sight less assholey than you are, you little schmuck. Robert is now decidedly concerned about where this conversation is going. Jacob is right up in his face. So you better listen good, because this may be your last chance. Your body is currently being kept alive, but that's not going to go on forever. Jacob gesticulates to Robert to look down, and they both watch as the clouds part. Below, they can see Robert's unconscious body in a hospital bed, covered in tubes linked up to monitors, with his mother and sister inside the room looking very concerned. Robert's face goes white with shock. Let me give you an update, Jacob says. The consultant has already written you off. You've got about 30% chance of pulling through this, so we need to get on with it. But if you really are as smart as you say you are, which I doubt, we should be able to get through this quite quickly. The first thing you've got to know is, you are a soul who's been encased in a mound of flesh on planet Earth. The body you were in is just a vehicle. It rots eventually, they all do. You get a hundred years tops before it all starts to fall apart. But your soul... That bit's eternal. It's a storehouse for everything you learn. And that's the bit that worries me, because yours, Robert, right now, it's not in good shape. You got it loaded with a whole heap of shit ideas and beliefs about life. About love. You forgot why the fuck you were down on Earth in the first place. And my job is to clean your act up. So tell me, Robert, you like movies? Robert nods obediently, not knowing what else to say. Oh, good because I got a right doozy of a movie to show you. It's the movie of your life so far, you son of a gun. You ready? A large screen appears in front of them, and Robert is transfixed. Jacob grins slightly manically. This is going to be good. This is where you get to see what you were really like, and exactly what you did to all those weak women who appeared in your world. It's about time you learnt how much you messed them up and hurt them. The movie begins with a young Robert being rude to his mother and sister at the dinner table. He complains about the quality of the food and the fact that they are both incompetent. We see him as an adolescent leaving a stream of girls devastated, confused and heartbroken. In his wake, having been dumped by him as soon as someone else took his fancy. We see him act like a bit of a bully in the workplace to the men and being charming and yet unfeeling with the women. It then moves to the courtroom and specific cases where he's defending the cases of very wealthy, mainly male clients. The movie doesn't stop in the courtroom, but pans out to show him the consequences of his actions. He sees what really happens within the marriages and the men and women that suffered at his hands in court. Let's take a little look-see at this one in particular, shall we, says Jacob. Let's look at Bill and Paula, your latest case. So it seems that Bill's this wealthy man you met at your private club, right? Robert nods. On the screen, he can see a montage of moments, from the time he was coaching Bill to the moments in court when he terrorised Paula in the dock. He also sees the effect their actions had on her and her children. All of them left terrified and all but destroyed. He's horrified at what he's seeing, especially as he knows what his part was in it all. In the divorce proceedings, he was trying to get full custody of the children. He was aiming to get limited visiting rights for his wife. So you built the case based on her being an unfit mother and role model for the children. Is that so? Robert nods again, his head hanging lower and lower in shame. But the truth of it all was that Bill had been psychologically and physically abusing her, hadn't he? Robert grimaces and nods. He regularly hit her as well, but you both denied it all. She turned to self-medicating with alcohol and was caught drink driving, and you used this evidence and other pieces of information to make a compelling case against her suitability. What you failed to share with the judge and jury was how much she really loved and looked after the children. Bill really didn't give a shit. He had no interaction or relationship with his children whatsoever. But for him and you, it was just about winning. Bill was more interested in his new young blonde girlfriend, who became the new carer for the children, even though she had no interest in them either. In fact, she resented having to look after them and was often negligent. Did you know that Bill winning the case broke Paula? Robert shakes his head. 
beyond embarrassed now. Yeah, seems Paula was left with nothing. She was left without a home and ended up in a woman's refuge. She had to attend AA meetings because she was desperately trying to clean up her act. The children suffered in their father's house as he was easily frustrated with them. Did you know he got aggressive with them too? Hell, Robert, can't you see that she was the one that had protected them from Bill? Jacob pauses the screen and turns to Robert, who's full of remorse. So what do you think of your story so far? Robert winces. It's not so good. But I was doing what I thought was right at the time. Really? And there was me thinking you were out to win for your client and make money, whatever the cost. But winning's what being a lawyer is all about. Yeah, but there are ways and means. I really thought a good lawyer was all about achieving justice. Call me naive, but hey buddy, there's no one judging you here. You get to work this out all by yourself. Okay, so maybe I was a bit hard on her, but I can't change any of it now, can I? Jacob sighs and picks up the remote control. Let's take a little look at some more of your handiwork, shall we? He rewinds the film. Robert sees case after case of his ruthless efficiency and the devastation he's caused to many lives. So many lives destroyed. Slowly it dawns on him that there are long-term consequences beyond winning the cases. Something he'd never given time to or contemplated as he was always too busy focusing on the next win. He shrinks down in his chair a little and looks at Jacob sheepishly. I was trying to do my best, you know. It's how the law is. I mean, what kind of lawyer would I be if I lost cases for my clients? Jacob shrugs and grins sardonically. Maybe you shouldn't have chosen scumbags for clients. Anyway, shall we have a look at you and your family then? Robert looks terrified. Do we have to? Oh yes, I think I'm going to enjoy this bit even more. I'm dying to see how well you treat people in your world. The film starts up again. He sees himself using his mother time and time again, dropping off his washing, expecting her to clean up after him in his apartment, ridiculing her for not doing things efficiently or up to his standard, and speaking to her in a very disrespectful and dismissive way. He sees that after his encounters with her, she's often left very distressed and in tears, but always makes excuses for him, such as him working really hard, his father not giving him enough attention, and blaming herself for not being a good enough mother. Jacob gives him a sidelong glance. Nice work. The movie shifts to encounters with his sister, Sarah. He sees them fighting right from the time they were little children, him minimalising any of her achievements and ridiculing her because of her chosen subjects in school. Then her job, the way she dresses, her loser friends and hobbies, and because she believes in spiritual matters such as the afterlife and reincarnation, him telling her she's woo-woo, and even though he often leaves her in tears, he also sees the moments when she does stand up to him and fight for her causes. Really cute, Jacob comments dryly. Robert remains silent. And your father. Let's take a looky at him, shall we? On the screen, he sees himself as a little boy in all kinds of different scenes, where he's clearly attempting to get and craving his father's attention. He can see that his father was always preoccupied, on the phone, reading documents, and eternally busy. He sees that he never played with his father, or went on any outings, or had any real special time. He sees lots of school events he participated in where his mother was the only one there. Through watching the various scenes, Robert suddenly realises that his father was almost always absent, even when present. Suddenly he feels very sad, and this is unexpected. He's used to feeling angry, tense, excited and irritated, but the sadness is a new emotion, one that he doesn't feel at all comfortable with. I guess I really didn't know my father at all. It was like living with a legend, inaccessible. Jacob nods compassionately. Why couldn't I see it until now? Up here you get a better perspective. There's no judgement up here because we see things as they really are. Down there, you're too busy living your life and reacting to things. It's easy to mess up. So what do I do now? Is it all too late? If you're prepared to do the work while you're here, you might get a second chance. If they don't turn off the machine. 
We don't have any influence over them. They have free will. You just got to hope that there's someone fighting for your corner. Robert is suddenly struck with the awful realisation that he has no real friends who might care enough, apart from his mother and perhaps his sister. A second realisation hits him, and a well of tenderness when he thinks of the two of them. He's very surprised at this. It's a new feeling, and it too feels very uncomfortable. He really hopes he doesn't have to feel it too often. He realises it's how the girls he messes with must feel. The only two I can think of are Sarah and Mum, and I don't think I deserve them caring for me much. I've not exactly been the greatest brother or son. No, you haven't, but I'm glad you realise it now. We might just be able to make some progress here. Accepting that you've been a total schmuck is the first step. Isn't that the second step in AA? Robert says. OK, smartass. Yeah, and you've got a whole load of making up to do. There may be a few more of those AA-type steps before we're done. I ain't going to be giving you the second and third chances like they do. This is a one-time deal. And you got to mean it. No doing stuff just to get off the hook. I know your type. Robert was amazed at how well Jacob could read his mind. So, do you want to do this? And we'd better get on with it, as we don't know how much time we've got. Looking at things down there, it might not be long. He points down below their feet, and the clouds open again. He sees his body in the hospital again. With him are his mum and Sarah and the medical team. They are deep in discussion. The tone is very sombre. It isn't looking good. This is the deal, Robert. You're going to have to dig deep. It's time to give up the selfish what's in it for me, I'm the captain of the universe bullshit attitude and wise up. It's not all about you or your father. There are a few things you need to know about him too. But right now, we need to concentrate on cracking open that cesspit you built around your heart. How the hell do I do that? Oh, trust me. This is where all the fun begins.